Season's greetings history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling we're looking at the history of Santa Claus and answering such burning questions as where did Santa Claus come from? Why does he have reindeer? How can he fit down a chimney? And crucially, what inspired his outfit? And is Santa Claus dressed like a Coke bottle? Along the way, we'll look at the history of St. Nicholas, who was the original inspiration for this famous Christmas character, and see how he went from Saint to Santa. <music> Please remember to like this video, share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel with notifications switched on so you never miss an upload. You can also follow me on Instagram where my username is History Calling. There's a link for that in the description box along with information on some of the sources I've used during my research for today's video if you'd like to learn more about Santa Claus and Christmas. The history of Santa Claus starts in the 4th century AD in what is now Turkey with this man, Saint Nicholas. We actually know very little about him except that he was Bishop of Myra during that century. A large number of legends grew up around him in the centuries after his death, however, including one that out of the goodness of his heart he secretly provided dowry money for the three daughters of a poor man so that they could marry rather than be sold into slavery. Another is that he resurrected three boys who had been robbed, murdered and pickled by an evil innkeeper whilst on their way to meet Nicholas. And this is why we see them rising out of the pickling caskets in this image. In general, the tales around him focused on his goodness, generosity and special kindness to children, though he also became known as a saint who would protect sailors and travellers, among others. He was traditionally said to have died on the 6th of December, with 343 a popular but disputed year for this event to have occurred. As a result, the 6th of December became the date on which he was remembered, just as the life of St. Patrick is celebrated on the 17th of March for the same reason. See my video on him for another example of how the lives of saints are celebrated. As Christianity spread throughout Europe, so too did the cult of St. Nicholas, and by 1087 he was so famous that his supposed bones were stolen from Myra by a group of merchants from the Italian city of Bari, who were hoping to make their home more appealing for pilgrims. These bones were supposedly found in his white marble tomb, floating in sweet-smelling holy liquid, and when taken to Bari, miracles began to occur there, as hordes of physically and mentally unwell people flocked to the remains and were healed. If you'd like to know more, I'll leave a link for a contemporary description of this theft, which is called a translation by the author, in the description box. In Bari, a swanky church was built for Nicholas, and his bones were buried within it, where you can still visit them today. Do the Italians really have Nicholas, though? A 2018 article from National Geographic, linked below, lists numerous places all over the world in which the remains, or parts of them, could be interred. Bari is on the list, alongside Venice, as Venetian tomb raiders apparently found some bits the Italians had left behind in Myra, and even Myra itself, now called Demra, has staked a claim, as questions have been raised as to whether the correct skeleton was ever stolen from his original tomb in the first place. There are also supposedly bits of him as far afield as Illinois, Russia and France. With so many competing claims, I'll leave you to decide what you believe. Nicholas's apparent benevolence, especially towards children, gradually gave rise during the medieval period to a tradition in Europe of parents giving gifts to their children on or around his Saint's Day on the 6th of December, though he was remembered in different ways in different countries. In the Netherlands, for instance, he was known as Sinterklaas, was dressed as a bishop and was credited with riding a white horse across the rooftops to leave presents for children in their shoes. When the Reformation came, Protestants were not in favour of the idea of saints, but rather than eradicate St Nicholas altogether, the tradition of gift-giving associated with him was moved to Christmas Eve or Christmas Day to better connect it with Christ. A Christ child was now the figure giving the gifts to rather than Nicholas, and this figure became known in some German-speaking areas as Christkindl, which is where the name Chris Kringle ultimately came from. In what is now the UK, Father Christmas became a popular substitute name for Saint Nick, and in fact my own letters to Santa when I was little were addressed to Father Christmas, and thank you to my mum for keeping a couple of them so that I could fact check that for you. 
We now travel to the United States, where the final metamorphosis from saint to santa was completed after the traditions surrounding Nicholas were imported there from European immigrants. In 1809, the author Washington Irving published a book entitled The History of New York. This included a dream sequence in which, quote, the good Saint Nicholas came riding over the tops of the trees in that self-same wagon wherein he brings his yearly presents to children. It was published, when else, on the 6th of December. The following year, the New York Historical Society began to hold a dinner in honour of Saint Nicholas Day. Nicholas's appearance and demeanour underwent a dramatic transformation in 1823, with the publication and great success of the famous poem The Night Before Christmas. Debate still rages as to whether it was authored by Clement Moore or Henry Livingstone, but for our purposes what matters is how Nicholas is described. The poem has him driving a flying sleigh full of toys on Christmas Eve. This is pulled by eight reindeer whose names were, you guessed it, Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Donner and Blitzen. Everything is in miniature though. Nicholas, the sleigh and even the reindeer. In fact, Nicholas is actually an elf and this is why he is able to fit down the chimneys of the children's homes where he deposits gifts in stockings. It also helps to explain the preponderance of elves in modern depictions of Santa. There are no more bishop's robes now though. Nicholas is dressed in furs, though covered in soot and ashes, and has a snowy white beard and a pipe. As for his physique, the poem says, He had a broad face and a little round belly, that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. So by 1823, we have almost arrived at a modern depiction of Santa Claus within this poem, and if you stay till the end of the video, I'll read out the whole thing for you. Incidentally, if you're wondering where Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is, he was actually a later invention, first appearing in a 1939 book by Robert Louis May. What about the name Santa Claus? When did that come into common usage? There were already some proto-versions of it floating around by the early 19th century, such as the aforementioned Sinterklaas, but what really helped to popularise the name was the republication of The Night Before Christmas in 1830 under the revised title An Account of a Visit from St Nicholas or Santa Claus. If you're interested in the etymology of these words, Santa is very close to Sancta, meaning saint, while Claus is a truncated version of Nicholas. There were still some tweaks to be made, however, in order to finish the transformation from St. Nicholas into the Santa Claus we recognise today. These were helped along by the increasing proliferation of print media in the 19th century, which allowed images of Santa to reach a larger number of people than ever before and solidified his appearance in the public consciousness. Historian Bruce David Forbes, for instance, whose book All About Christmas is linked below, has argued that the pictures drawn by cartoonist Thomas Nast for the Harper's Weekly magazine during the later 19th century were largely responsible for these final amendments to Santa's appearance. Nast made him a full-sized man and added elements to his lore, such as his home at the North Pole, where he made toys with the help of elves and received correspondence from children all over the world. Even the food left out for him to eat while he visited homes is traced to Nast. To finish up, let's look at Santa's clothing and at one of the most enduring 20th and now 21st century legends about his appearance. The idea that he wears red and white because of a Coca-Cola marketing campaign which started in the 1930s using illustrations by artist Haddon Sundblom and which wanted to associate him with their brand colours. This is a story you'll hear trotted out quite often, but it isn't true. Though some older images of Santa do show him in colours besides red and white, such as this one in which he wears a green cloak, or this illustration for the night before Christmas in which he wears brown and is still shown as an elf, there are also plenty of images which predate the 1930s which have him wearing his now stereotypical outfit. His colours are not a Coca-Cola invention, nor does the company pretend otherwise. In an article on their website, which I'll leave linked below for you, they state that even though it's often said that Santa wears a red coat because red is the colour of Coca-Cola, Santa appeared in a red coat before Sundblom painted him. So there you have it, history lovers, a breakdown of how the world got from St Nicholas in the 4th century AD all the way up to the modern Santa Claus, with his reindeer, sleigh, elven helpers, red and white outfit, home slash workshop at the North Pole, 
and pensioned for sneaking down chimneys and scoffing milk and biscuits whilst leaving gifts for children. Let me know in the comments below what your favourite Santa Claus memory is. Perhaps it's a family member dressing up as him, a really good Santa you saw in a shop once, or your preferred depiction of him on the big screen. Wherever you are in the world, if you celebrate Christmas, then I hope you have a wonderful one. If you don't, then I'll just wish you a happy and peaceful 25th of December. And now, as promised, let's end with the poem, The Night Before Christmas. Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mamma in her kerchief and I in my cap had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave a lustre of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eyes did appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer? With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment he must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the coursers they flew, with the sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then in a twinkling I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes how they twinkled, his dimples how merry, his cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly, that shook when he laughed, like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him, in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Till next time, everyone, keep learning.